I think first up, right, Aaron, it would be great to know a little bit about your background. Um, you know, uh, I, yeah, previous work, uh, where it all began, where you studied, just, just the sure. story. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely have a very uh, sort of interesting and, and uh, a different kind of background. I, um, I started working for my dad when I was 12 years old. Okay. Um, and he, he had a just a wholesale distribution business for security equipment, like automatic gates that open and close. Yeah. And and so he, I start, I literally started in the back room packing boxes. Like I, I wanted to work with him. I, I I thought it was cool, but you know he's like, what can this twelve year old kid do? So he just put me in the back room and I was packing boxes and taping up boxes. That that was my job. Um, and so I gradually, you know, I, I just sort of had to prove myself and learn it from the ground up. But um, I gradually was, you know, doing inventory and then sort of running ops and then sort of took over marketing for him and ended up um, <clears throat> actually um, I've had to do my uh, my college work uh, much more slowly because right when I was graduating from high school, his industry just took this huge dive. So it was sort of like all hands on deck. Um, no time for anybody to leave, especially low paid, you know, <laughs> 17 and 18 year old employees like me. <laughs> so, 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 uh, so that was great. And in 2002, actually I'll back up in 2000, um, one of his other people, a good friend of mine, uh, the three of us, my dad and this other guy and I, said, you know, we should try and start something new. The internet is, is you know, I was just really intrigued. I, 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 got, I got us, you know, all computerized in 1994. And then I got, uh, you know, with, with network and everything. And then I got, um, I got us connected to the internet in like 1995, you know. And so we literally just had one computer sitting in the corner that would dial up to the internet. And that was the whole office internet connection. And, <laughs> okay. You know, it, it was just a backup. And so, um and my dad would come out and say, you got to get that thing off the internet. I'm trying to send a fax, you know, because it's using the same phone line. So, so in, uh, in 2000, we decided to sort of get something started. We didn't have a lot of focus in that. We just started up a little something, doing some web consulting, trying to yeah. develop something new. Yeah. In 2002, um, I actually went out, you know, the, the industry, my dad's industry continued to get tougher and tougher. And so... Um, I sort of hit the road and started trying to sell his company to a larger competitor. Okay. And we did that in 2000. We actually did that in December of 2001. Okay. And so just a very interesting set of experiences for me where, you know, it, by by the time that I was, you know, basically 20, 21 years old, yeah. um, here I've, I've, you know, sort of come up uh, from the from packing boxes to running ops to running marketing to um, – to, to selling a company. Yeah. And so it was a very interesting set of experiences. Okay. And uh, so we launched out with this sort of web consulting thing, sold that company. My dad actually went to work for the, for the new company as okay. the new branch manager. You know, that was, that was his job. Um, my, the other partner and I sort of split off and did the web thing for a while. And after a little while, we quickly figured out that um, the real value was in building a product. Yeah. Uh, we actually sold the web consulting business in, I would say, 2005, and we um, and we launched out into something called BizFlex, which was business operation software for um, wholesale distribution companies. For okay. First customer was the company we sold my my dad's company to. You know, they, <laughs> they, they they did their entire operation. Um, we actually funded most of the development from that contract because yeah. we sort of built it to suit them. Yeah. Uh, made a boatload of mistakes with that company, um, you know, but, but that, that's in hindsight, you can always figure out what your mistakes were. <laughs> uh, probably the biggest one was that uh, we did an exclusive for that industry yeah. with, with that company. We'd say, so it's like we had the best business operations software um, for that industry and we couldn't sell it to anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was not the, uh, the, the smartest move. Um, but we were doing fairly well. We were sort of, you know, taking it out to other industries and we were doing fairly well. We we're making most of our numbers. And, um, and so the, uh, uh we, uh, I could not for the life of me get any venture capitalists to believe in 2005 and, and early 2006 that 
that small businesses were going to buy their software over the internet. Okay. Right? It's just like the dot com bust had happened, and everybody was like, no, 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 no. Um, small businesses buy their software in boxes off of the shelf. It's called QuickBooks, and it's just <laughs> never going to happen. And so, you know, deal with it. <laughs> so, so about, about mid 2006, you know, here, here we built this. And again, you know, a, a series of, of, of life lessons, right? Yeah. We built the thing. And I mean, we were like, oh, do we shut this down? Do we, um, do we go all in and do we try and raise our, cause we'd said, you know, we're going to need like $25 million in capital to make this happen. We'd raised the first million yeah. and now we need to raise our 5 million series A. Yeah. And I was like, do we, you know, how, how do we do this? Do, do we, do we go all in and go for like a private equity round with some alternative investment guys? Yeah. So that's what we did. And I sunk, um, this will be funnier in a moment, but I sunk way more of my money then fit my risk tolerance okay, <laughs> <laughs> into, into that company. And, uh, and so literally we were, we, we were working on this private equity round um, and we were, we were doing okay as a company, but uh, about two weeks before the 5 million series A was going to close, the lead investor went to the hospital and died. Oh, so, wow. Oh, okay. That just, we just, we hit the wall at 90 miles an hour. Very, uh, I mean, a huge life lesson, a huge, um, an experience I don't want to have to go through again, but yeah. I think I learned a lot from it yeah. um, and learned a lot about, uh, about risk tolerance. That's for sure. Um, which, which again, gets funnier in just a minute, but <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, from there, uh, I, uh, I went now. Now, mind you, that software's still running. It still works uh, for some. We still got some clients on it. Yeah. Um, it operates off. You know, I, I I'm not really that involved with it at this point. Yeah. Uh, but it, it it operates for a few customers, and that's great. Yeah. An services company. Okay. And so they needed to build a product development team. Okay. They never had one. Their marketing people would just sort of put together something and get it out there. Yeah. They had a great marketing team, but they needed to build uh, the ability. To do technology products. Yeah, yeah, and okay. So, so I went aboard with them, uh, ran their global product development uh, for four years. Okay. And and so that was really my first, <clears throat> the first time that I was really working in financial services. Built yeah. a lot of friendships there. Yeah. Um, uh, worked with a lot of great people. Um, and, and that, you know, about halfway through that company was acquired, which further, uh, you know, increased my exposure to other parts of the financial services industry. Yeah. And it's a very interesting industry. It's dynamic in a lot of ways and it's static in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that I really saw while I was there were the huge holes that exist yeah. for individual investors, because for individual investors, it's like, there's, there's some things that are, that there's one thing that's scarce. And there's two things that are incredibly um, uh, vast and, and, and not scarce, okay? Uh, the, there are probably 14,000 stocks and ETFs and mutual funds that you can invest in. Okay. Um, and there's probably 269 million web pages and TV channels and radio shows <laughs> where you can get ideas for investing. Yeah. And on the, on the flip side, right, there's all kinds of places you can go to execute investments. Yeah. Um, you know, there's like 5,000 re registered brokerage firms in the United States. There's yeah. like 550,000 registered brokerage uh, uh, representatives yeah. in the United States. So, so there's no shortage of, of ideas and there's no shortage of execution yeah. where the, the scarcity is is in trying to figure out how to convert ideas into decisions yeah. because in, uh, an investing decision is how you, is how you get to execution. And so um, there's this great technology that quantifies risk tolerance uh, <laughs> that, that it, it's, a, it's an old friend of mine who had invented it and it sort of sat on the shelf for a long time. He's a PhD in complex dynamic systems and computer science. Yeah. And like any good rocket scientist, he started to invest his money and he goes, the, the way that that the financial world assesses risk and designs portfolios is just baloney. So I'm going to invent my own way of doing it. So he did that, patented it. And, uh, and so, so we started off with that 
Um, and so that company's called Riskalyze. It's going incredibly well. We're very excited about it. And putting it into the internet and letting them sift through the world's investments and find the ones that fit them. Uh, it's, it's a really exciting thing. Um, it's really helping people understand their investments better yeah. and get to decisions better. So we're excited about it. So that, that in a very long nutshell, is, is my career and background. I mean, there, there's obviously you, you've gone through a, a heck of a lot. It's a very interesting journey. And what, what were some of, or what was, or were some of the defining moments in this journey that that you always look back and say, "Wow, that that, that one, that one really shook me." Um, sure, sure. I, you know, it, it is a crack up to say that I have had a 21 career, or I'm sorry, a 21 year career at the age of 33. Right? Yeah. Um, but. <laughs> But at the, my dad apparently knew nothing about child labor laws. You know, what I <laughs> so, um, so I, at the same time, you know, I, it was definitely a really painful and difficult experience to hit the wall many miles an hour with with that company in in business ops software. Right? I mean, it was just um, I had a lot of people working for me. It it was painful to go through that. It's one of those things that I never want to do again. Um, I don't know, you know, it's in the startup world, sometimes you can't avoid that, right? But um, but I, I, I feel like it's my job as CEO uh, to make sure that we've always got cash in the bank, that we're always headed in the right direction, and that we're not um, stuck on the wrong trajectory. Because yeah. I think that's probably the biggest thing that I've learned from that is the concept of trajectory. And I've been meaning to blog on this for a while, but, you know, it's like, uh, the, the, the most important thing you can do, right, in a startup is to accurately assess the trajectory that you are on. Yeah. Because if you get the trajectory wrong, um, you know, a startup is like trying to leap over a huge chasm. Yeah. And if you get the trajectory wrong, you will hit the side of the canyon, canyon wall on the other side, right? <laughs> yeah. And it'll just bounce off the side of the chasm and fall to the ground. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Um, and, and, and typically they don't, they don't allow parachutes. So, <laughs> um, so, so that's the, 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 uh, to me, that's probably the biggest thing that I've learned. And, 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 you know, the, from that life experience is you've got to really accurately assess what that trajectory is and make sure that you're, that you're on it. There are many things that at least the Aaron I know stands for. So there's obviously Risk Allies, right? Uh, which sure. is uh, which is your your company, your 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 yeah. your baby. Uh, then of course there's Africa. There is uh, there are the Adami Tulu yeah. and the Project Zwe uh, stuff that you do. Uh, and then yeah. it's your kids and the whole story behind them. And I'd I'd, yeah. lo I'd I'd love for you to talk us through these things that you know these things outside outside of your work life sure. that that complete you. Sure. Sure. I, I think that, um, well, so my wife and I decided to adopt in 2006. Okay. And in November of 2007, our son Spencer, who was born in South Korea, yeah. um, came home. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we flew to Seoul and brought him home. Yeah. And we decided to do that again in October of 2008. Yeah. And, um, and so we decided at that point to switch to a different adoption program. And our daughter, Emma, was born in Ethiopia. Yeah. And in, um, literally, we met her Christmas morning of 2009. Okay. Um, and it was, it was just awesome. Best Christmas present ever. <laughs> and then flew home with her on New Year's Day 2010. Oh, wow. And so, so that, you know, that has really, really uh, changed our lives. And a lot of, it, it's, it's really sort of interesting. It's hard to explain. Um, if you haven't been an adoptive parent before, but a lot of people will stop and say something to me like, thank you for what you're doing for these kids. Right. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing is, is I don't really see it that way. Yeah. Um, what, what these kids have done, uh, for Casey and I and, yeah. and bringing this level of richness into our lives, yeah. um, is really vastly more than what we could ever do for them, you know? And so, um, really, adoption is about uh, finding families for kids, yeah. um, and so uh, not finding kids for families. <laughs> and so, it's 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 really uh, an awesome, awesome thing. Got like you know, so you came to Ethiopia. You had a two day trip, uh, two day trip to the south of Ethiopia, and of course, you were saying, you know, yeah. it's like it's like going to London and, and thinking Central London is is all there is. So, so from there onwards, You're right? Yeah. Right. 
So when we were on that trip, you know, uh, we we really saw the global orphan crisis very recently. There's 163 million people in the world, and it's an explosive problem. It's 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 a really difficult problem, and a lot of it has to do. There's a lot of core issues behind it. A lot of it has to do with um, poverty in the developing world and how we flooded, you know, for example, the continent of Africa with aid. Um, but a lot of that aid hasn't actually reached where it needed to go. We sort of created a dependent continent, yeah. and that's that doesn't really work either. So adoption is part of the solution, but, you know, one continent can't just adopt another continent's kids, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's, not, that's not a total solution to the problem. Yeah. So um, you have to go deeper than that, and I, I think what we saw was our passion was let's try and make sure, let's, let's start investing in solving the problem. Yeah. And you solve the problem by preventing kids from becoming orphans in the first place. Yeah. And I think that starts with two things. It starts with basically food and education because if you can if you can help families stay together, yeah. you know, these families who are right there on the razor's edge of poverty, yeah. and if you can help them uh, help their kids get a, get a great education, yeah. then you can prevent them from becoming orphans in the first place, and you can help them yeah. break the cycle of poverty and yeah. become self-sufficient. Yeah. Because it's never going to work if all we do is keep shipping money to Africa, right? <laughs> so we, we, we've got to we've got to break that cycle of, of dependency and break that cycle of poverty yeah. and create self sufficiency. So um, I, I took another trip back there to sort of explore this in September of 2010. Okay. Um, uh, just traveled throughout the country and looked at, at, at some different things, and I just I, I walked onto this. T- site in a dummy Tulu, this tiny little village of about, uh, I think it's like 3,000 people or something like that, yeah. and um, it, it just just hit me. I mean, it was an incredible experience. The kids uh, were all there. They came out, and at one point, I pulled my smartphone and was, and was playing a video for them um, on my Android, and I'm playing a video for them, and they all start crowding around, and at some point, the sky sort of closed in because there were about 80 kids piled on top trying to see the video. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it was just incredible. It was an incredible experience, and, uh, and uh, it was clear that that's where we wanted to be and where we wanted to invest. And, and there was a sister school right down the road in a slightly larger village called Zawai, it's right on this big lake called Lake Zawai. You can find it on Google Maps. It's okay. really cool. Okay. Um, the biggest industry that's there, actually, you can see on Google Maps. It's these massive 22-acre greenhouses, okay. and they supply all of the roses for the country of Denmark. It's just a fascinating story. What? So, wow. Uh, yeah, crazy. So um, so anyway, that's the biggest industry there. You drive up the highway from the Dami Chula to Zawai, and you drive past these greenhouses. Yeah. There are actually... Um, the, the saddest thing to see is there are all these people who sit right outside the greenhouses yeah. in the hopes that somebody inside will get sick or have to leave for the day, oh. and, and they might get a day of work. Uh, okay. It's just a place without a lot of hope. It's a place without a lot of opportunity. Yeah. So these schools are really exciting. We, we raised about $45,000 to build a four-classroom building in Adami Tulu, um, and that uh, – that, got started or we actually opened that up uh, to 120 new kids 140 new kids in uh, August or September of, of, of last year and so then we started the project to fund another classroom building at Dami Tulu and a big classroom building at Sawai okay and that was mammoth um, but it was amazing to watch it come together and we raised uh, about three hundred thousand um, dollars you play a big role in that thank you um, and, and so we raised about three hundred thousand dollars. And uh, so those those buildings are under construction right now. I need to blog the photos yeah. uh, because it's really awesome to see. Um, and then the other thing that we've done is we've launched on the web, adamitubluproject.com, where you can actually sponsor individual kids at the school. Um, and so my team went over in January, photographed about, about a, little, a little under 200 of the kids at Adami Tulu School and put their story, you know, a little bit about their story, um, up on the web. Uh, and so we've got people sponsoring them. It's, it's, it's pretty close, about nine more kids, and we'll be halfway done wow. uh, for those 200. And, uh, and, and we're sponsoring them for just 19 bucks a month. $19 a month is giving them breakfast and lunch every day yeah. and an awesome education that will let them break the, the cycle of poverty and become self-sufficient. So we're, we're pretty, pretty excited about that. The final leg of the stool there is 
we want to work over the next few years to help them launch some self-sustaining business ventures to fund the operations of the school. Yeah. The goal is five years from now, 50% of the school's operating costs are covered by the business ventures. Yeah. And at that point, we'll be able to either cut the price of the sponsorship for everyone or maybe redirect people over to where there's need somewhere else. Yeah. But the yeah. goal, again, is just to have this project continually be bringing more and more people into self-sufficiency. Yeah. And out of So we're, we're excited about that. Oh, wow. That is indeed exciting. That is that is very exciting. So, you know, I, I, have, I have probably five more minutes just so, just so I don't take too long uh, of your time as well. I, I think one quick one. Now, I, I, I obviously have, a, I have quite some background about Riskalyze just following your blog. But it, let's, let's imagine um, I am a third party random guy who's listening to you now. Right. And, and in, in, in just, okay. in, in just yeah. a minute, what, what is what is Riskalyze and. And I guess most importantly, what does it do for me? Because uh, that's probably what I'm most sure. uh, keen to, to to understand. Sure. Um, Riskalyze is all about quantifying your risk tolerance because uh, making a set of investment decisions or building your optimal investment portfolio really should just be a simple mathematical equation. The problem is half the equation is your tolerance for risk buried in your sort of in your gut that are capture that from you. And quantify it uh, into a math, you know, a quantitative mathematical function that we can then put into the internet and literally go sift through the world's investments and find the ones that fit you. So it's a little bit like being able to Google investments that fit you. Now, if you go to Google and you type that in, I can guarantee you that you will find two things. You will find ar- articles about investments that have been hot in the past. Yeah. Which. You know, is not that, that's not necessarily going to be how it works in the future, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can find a bunch of ads for companies saying, "Pick me, pick me, yeah. invest in me, or you use me to invest your money," right? Yeah. And so that doesn't solve the problem. So we're building uh, the personalization layer yeah. for for the internet for investing. We predict the future, so we're going to tell you these investments are going to well in the future. But you're going to go in and say, "Here are my investment ideas. Yeah. And here is what I believe the future holds." for the economy as a whole uh, or for these individual investments, right? And then here's my risk tolerance. Here's my unique risk fingerprint. Um, and when you put that in to risk alive, uh, it can calculate an optimal portfolio that fits you. Ah, wonderful. So, so that's, that, that, that's uh, extremely helpful. Uh, a lot of people who, you know, are, are becoming leaders and, you know, leaders in their lives sure. of themselves, at sure. least at the very least, right? Uh, and then, sure. of course, of organizations, of people, of their families. Now, what sure. is what is what are things that you've learned along the way that you always think you need to pass on, and and things, uh, you know, that yeah, as something that you've heard or something that you've experienced that you would like to pass on to. Sure. To people like I would me. Say for me, <laughs> the the probably the most important lesson is just that every moment counts, right? And to be very purposeful and very intentional. And, and I don't think people think a lot about um, what kind of life they want to have and what kind of things they want to do and how to build their, their routines and their life and their structures and their systems around achieving that. I, I think you have a, you're, you're a great example of that too, right? Because you sent me an email about 12 hours ago and you said, hey, I don't really check my email uh, on, on this weekend, right? Because, and that's a system that you've built to help you achieve what you want to achieve. And I think that's a great example. And everybody has, has different ones they want to use. For me, a great example is now I, I work, I'm, I'm the CEO of a technology startup, right? So I work very hard throughout the week and I typically do some work on Saturdays. I mean, I typically work a, a six hour day or so on Saturdays. Yeah. Um, that's just life. Yes. Uh, it, it's Sunday morning. Uh, we, we go to church and then we spend Sunday afternoon doing something fun together as a family or with friends. And so Sunday is the day that I do very little work. I, I might, you know, uh, just do a little bit of prep later that night just to make sure I'm ready. But I try to get that prep done on Saturday so I can leave Sunday focused completely on my family. Um, and I think, you know, like I said, that's not for everyone. Everybody has to have their own set of systems, but if you are intentional about how you structure your life, um, then you will you, you're going to be a lot more successful in achieving the outcomes. I think that, that you're looking to to achieve. 
You know, my dad taught me so much uh, about business and about life and, and just about everything. And, and he and I are still fantastic friends and, and we just, we get along great. Um, I would say that as I, you know, that there were a couple of different things. I saw him do that a lot and be very dedicated to his family. So that yeah. was great. Um, I think that I, um, I remember a song that I listened to. Uh, by the artist Stephen Curtis Chapman, called literally called "This Moment," okay, and just talking about you know don't uh, don't miss. He actually wrote a whole album that was sort of centered around that idea. And another song was called Cinderella. And he was talking about missing moments with his daughters. Okay, and the song "This Moment" was about you know savoring every moment, living in the moment, not just constantly living in the future about what you where you hope to be. Yeah, uh, but savoring the moments that you're in. And so, you know, a lot of that kind of thinking uh, in 2007 really led me to, to to start being more intentional about those kinds of things. Oh, wow. And, um, and so I, I, I would say that's probably a, just, just life learning, right? Oh, that is fantastic. 